Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we are continuing with my Minecraft archaeology series by building Tapu Tapuetea, which was the primary religious and political center in eastern Polynesia at least as far back as the 15th and 16th centuries. Tapu Tapuetea is on the island of Raiatea in the Society Islands of French Polynesia. Traditionally, the island of Raiatea is where Ta'aroa, the father of Polynesian gods and the creator of everything, first entered the earth and created Hawaii, which is another name for Raiatea. Tapu Tapuetea is a large UNESCO World Heritage Site that includes two forested valleys, a portion of the local lagoon, a coral reef, and a strip of the open ocean. Within that area, there are dozens of marae, or sacred ritual spaces, where the world of the living, or te ao, intersects with the world of the ancestors and gods, or te po. There are also archery platforms, gardens, and landscape features like the sacred passage through the reef, te avamoa. Marae Taputapuatea sits towards the edge of the peninsula, looking out towards te avamoa. This marae was built by 1000 AD at the latest, but while there has been a lot of archaeological work done on the site, there aren't many publicly accessible documents talking about what was found. Now, I can't build the entire area of the World Heritage Site because it's so big. So what I'm going to be building today is Marae Taputapuetea, Marae Hauviri, which is near Marae Taputapuetea, and Oputeina, which is a less prominent marae along the coast that sits right next to Marae Hauviri. Now, before I get too far into building, I do want to say that these are sacred sites for many people, and there are many people who live on Raiatea and use these sites for ritual purposes. So I'm going to be building the courtyards and the ahu or raised platforms at the back and I'll put in some representations as best I can of the monoliths that are positioned in the courtyards but I am only going to be putting a placeholder for this particular statue on the southwestern corner of Marae Taputapuetea because I don't know how sacred this particular statue is and I don't think I can respectfully represent it using what is available in Minecraft. As I'm terraforming I want to talk a bit about how this site gained UNESCO World Heritage status and what archaeological research has been done at this site. The Tapu Tapuetea Marae Complex became a World Heritage Site in 2017 after significant campaigning by Napapa Eva'u, a local cultural heritage organization which is dedicated to preserving and maintaining traditional knowledge and sites on Raiatea. Napapa Eva'u began their work in 2006 and engaged archaeologists, historians, and local elders in their efforts to recover generations of traditional knowledge lost or hidden away due to British and French colonial practices. They felt that engaging heritage experts in tandem with local elders would allow for a respectful reconstruction and protection of the site that used standard preservation methods in the field while also emphasizing local traditions. This leads to a really important point. Archaeology is all well and good, but archaeology that doesn't involve the local community generally misses the mark in a number of ways, and previous work at Tapu Tapuatea is a good example. The first evidence for archaeological fieldwork on the island comes from Kenneth Emery's surveys starting in 1925. Kenneth Emery was an ethnologist from the Bishop Museum in Hawaii who came to Raiatea to systematically record local archaeological sites and local traditional knowledge connected to them. He created dozens of mud maps, or roughly drawn maps of the valley landscapes, noting places place names and even making scale drawings of the physical remains in certain locations. Emery spoke with local informants to gather most of his findings, and his work is incredibly significant today because it contained place names that were no longer known by the 21st century when Napapa Eva'u began their work. Even descendants of those who helped Emery were not aware of the role their ancestors played in this research until Napapa Eva'u uncovered it. So while Emery did excellent work and included locals in his endeavors, that work did not make it back to the local local community until almost a century later, and only after local community members chased it down. Efforts led by Yoshiko Sinoto, also of the Bishop Museum, in the 1960s aimed to restore Marae Taputapuetea and Marae Hauviri, the two paved marae I'm building here. Sinoto employed locals for physical labor, but did not consult with them on the process or extent of restoration, and locals were not aware of the results of the archaeological conclusions made as a result of their efforts. From 1995 to the late 2000s, there 
there were many, many archaeological surveys, excavations, and restoration projects at Teputapuatea and the surrounding valley as part of an attempt to again restore the ancestral landscape to what it once was. Unfortunately, most of the results of these efforts are limited to grey literature, which are unpublished archaeological reports created after every archaeological project, usually for government or official use. These reports can be publicly available in some countries, but often are not accessible more generally. As of 2016, there was no detailed account of either the excavation or the restoration efforts for at least Marai Hauviri, but possibly for the other Marai as well. Additionally, much of the local community was not involved in the projects from 1995 to the late 2000s, and many community members were not even aware any of them had occurred except for the final survey and excavation. This final project did involve assistance from an elder, but the results had yet to be communicated to that elder as of 2010. These restoration efforts likewise did not consult with locals about the process or extent of restoration, and that led to some controversy. The team constructed a basalt wall around the platform at Marai Hauviri because the director of the project noted that there was archaeological evidence of a wall at some time in the past. However, archaeologists, including Yoshiko Sinoto, who led restoration efforts in the 1960s, have noted that since the site should be restored to its most recent historical form, and Marae did not have walls at that time, there shouldn't be a wall in the restoration. Napape Eva'u sought documents from both restoration efforts and is currently tasked with maintaining appropriate restoration practices throughout the area. You'll see that as I build that version, I do build it with the wall, but only because the images I could find still had a wall around Marae Hauviri, and I thought it was better to represent the site as it currently looks instead of trying to make assumptions about how locals or Napapa Eva'u might want to change that restoration if they decide to do so. So why is the lack of communication around excavations, survey work, and restoration problematic? Well, for starters, the people who live at a site usually have the largest or one of the largest connections to the site. They're what we call stakeholders. Doing archaeological work without involving or communicating to your stakeholders is generally bad science and also generally bad ethics. I've encountered digs where the site director decided not to tell locals what we were doing or what we found, and the result was that people tended to feel like foreigners or outsiders were taking their heritage away from them. Needless to say, I did not go back to work on that dig again. I have also been a part of digs where locals specifically hired us to help them avoid having outsiders come into their community and not tell them the results of heritage work. Turning this around, just think for a moment about the most important place in your life, one that has huge amounts of meaning for you. Now think about how you would feel if someone came in, dug it up without talking to anybody who felt remotely strongly about the place, and then restored it to something that they say was how it looked previously, but without ever talking to you or to anyone else for whom that site held any meaning at all. Chances are they'd do something you really didn't like, and you would be justifiably upset. Tapu Tapuatea is not alone in falling victim to archaeologists or other heritage professionals doing research and not involving the local community. It's unfortunately a relatively common occurrence around the world. Many communities understandably respond by disallowing any future archaeological work or disallowing any archaeological work done by outsiders. At Tapu Tapuatea, locals still feel that restoration of the marae and other sites is important for conservation and for respecting their ancestors, and that the best way to do that is by involving archaeologists and heritage professionals. By the same token, they emphasize that restoration, investigation, and visitation of Tapu Tapuatea must be done with care and respect for local customs, and that is what they have been working to do for the last several decades. Okay, so let's talk about these marae. All of the marae I'm building today use two primary materials, basalt cobblestone and large slabs of coral, many of which are actually about three meters high. So when I say large slabs of coral, I mean large slabs of coral. The first marae is Marae Taputapuatea, which is generally the most well-known marae at the site, at least to outsiders. Test excavations in 1965 uncovered evidence of a lower pavement level in the courtyard and also uncovered evidence of a second ahu or platform at the back that was a little bit shorter and is covered by the current ahu that sits there today. I couldn't find anything that showed evidence for the older ahu and the older courtyard being from the same period, but we can say that there was at least one earlier structure and perhaps even either a few iterations of that earlier structure or maybe even a few earlier structures here that were built before the one that we can see today. Marae Hauviri, which is the one that I'm building now, is the marae where the Tamatoa high chiefs of Ra'iatea were invested. When 
When Emery recorded this muralla in 1925, he noted that it only had the platform at the back and the large white stone you can see here. After reconstruction in the 1990s, Marai Haviri now has a paved courtyard of basalt cobblestone, as well as the controversial wall surrounding the courtyard, which is also made of basalt cobblestone. And the final site that I'm going to build today is Oputeina, which is a less opulent marae on the coast that sits directly next to Marae Haviri. Oputeina still has an ahu, but the platform is generally shorter and the courtyard is made of sand rather than paved in basalt cobblestones. We don't have lots of details about activities at the site during specific dates or time periods prior to European contact. At the time, Ra'iatea consisted of nine main chiefdoms. Opua, the chiefdom that these marae are in, was controlled by Ari'i or Chief Tama Toa, and was considered the most powerful chiefdom from the 17th to 18th centuries. When Ta'aroa arrived from the sky, he placed his right foot at Opoa. A marae was founded there and named Vayarai, which is still located at the south end of the riverbank. The site was recorded in the early 1930s with evidence of disturbed pavement, four basalt stones aligned in a pattern, and one upright basalt block. Later, stones were taken from Marae Vayarai to create new marae on both sides of the island, one of which is located in Matahirai Ter'i in Opoa and was dedicated to Ta'aroa. By at least the 16th century, this marae became associated with the new god Oro, who seems to have appeared in the last few generations before European contact. Oro is the son of Ta'aroa and is the god of fertility and war. Given the change in association, the marae was renamed to Va'io Taha and then again to Tapu Tapu Atea. After the marae was renamed to Marae Tapu Tapu Atea, but before initial European contact, the marae actually served as the point where the Ti'ahawatea alliance was formed. This alliance joined the islands west of Ra'iatea, called Te Aotea, with those east of Ra'iatea, or Te Auri, and they included the Cook Islands, the Austral Islands, and the Society Islands. The earliest account of European contact from local tradition comes from 1722, when Jacob Roggeveen, who was a Dutch admiral, crossed the Pacific in search of the fabled southern continent. One of his ships actually ran aground near Takapoto, which is a small atoll in the Palliser Islands. Some of the ship's crew then sailed in smaller vessels to Makatea, where they actually killed some of the local people. Both the bloodshed and the wreck of the ship off Takapoto was one of the first times that locals of the island had encountered Europeans, and because of those events, rumors of these outsiders quickly spread. The Ti'ahawatea alliance was maintained in the following years, but tentatively. Then, at one of the great sacred gatherings at Tapu Tapu Atea, a chief from the Auri side of the alliance argued with the high priest of the Aotea side and killed him. The chief of Aotea, angry that his high priest had been murdered and, at an important ceremony no less, sought out the high priest of Auri and killed him in retaliation. In the ensuing chaos, the people of Aotea quickly fled Ra'iatea, but they did so via Te Avarua, which is the mundane or ordinary passage through the reef, rather than through the sacred passage of Te Ava Mo'a. Leaving through the mundane passage, particularly when leaving a sacred gathering, was seen as a bad omen, and that, combined with the bloodshed, just destroyed the Te Ahawatea alliance. In 1763, warriors from Bora Bora attacked Ra'iatea under the command of a man named Puni. According to local oral tradition, warriors of Ra'iatea had the upper hand in the sea battle until their allies from Taha'a betrayed them by arriving to fight alongside Bora Bora. After this betrayal, the warriors from Ra'iatea were quickly quickly defeated, and those from Bora Bora swiftly landed on the island, killing women and children, destroying gardens, houses, and canoes, and attacking Marai Taputapuatea. They pulled down the dwellings of the gods on the Marai, destroyed the platform, and cut down the trees that sheltered the altar, and provided the link between Te Ao and Te Po. Distraught at the destruction, a priest named Vaito actually went into a trance and made a prophecy. The glorious children of Tutumu will come and see this forest at Taputapuatea. Their body is different. Our body is different. We are one species, only from Tutumu. And this island will be taken by them. The old rules will be destroyed, and sacred birds of the land and sea will also arrive here, will come and lament over that which this lop tree has to teach. They are coming up on a canoe without an outrigger. The young chief at the time, Mao'a, hid in the mountains for a time with his mother Te'e'eva, but soon there was nowhere safe for them to stay, so they fled to Papara on Tahiti. Kapaya, who was a priest of Oro who was connected to the young chief and was wounded in the battle, hid for a time in the mountains until he could travel again. Once he was able to do so, he also sailed to Papara and joined Mao'a and Te'e'eva along with the chief of Papara, Amo, and his wife Purea. Now, 
There is a lot of information about Topaya, Purea, Amo, and their political standing on Tahiti over the next six years. I would love to go into it, but you may have noticed that this episode is a little long already, so I definitely don't have time to do it justice in this episode because it is such an interesting story. Just to give you a little hint of it, Tupaya, Amo, and Purea were all present at Matavai Bay when the HMS Dolphin was anchored there, and they were present during the battle that ensued. All three of them were also involved in inter-island politics and war resulting from questions of who would be Paramount Chief or Ari'irahi of Tahiti. They also had direct contact with Captain Cook and the crew of the Endeavor, especially Purea and Tupaya, and by the time the Endeavor left Point Venus and Matavai Bay, Tupaya actually felt that he had so little left in Tahiti that he actually decided to sail with Cook instead. Honestly, if you thought the political side of the story for Bran Castle was interesting, the saga of Amo, Purea, and Tupaya over the next six years is just as complex and just as interesting. If you'd like to find out more, I highly recommend reading this book, Aphrodite's Island, The European Discovery of Tahiti by Anne Salmond. While the title sounds very Eurocentric, the book itself is very good at emphasizing the Tahitian and Polynesian side of the story and explains much of the political context of Tahiti at the time. It's also available to rent for free from Archive archive.org, so if you're interested, check out the link in the description down below. Anyway, back to Ra'ietea, Tapu Tapuatea, and the attack from Borobora. As I said, the local chief Ma'a had to flee, along with many of the priests of the island, including Tupaya. But the warriors from Borobora didn't destroy everything, and some locals still lived on the island in the following years. But the desolation was pretty stark. Now, the only documentation I could find of Ra'ietea after the attack by Puni of Borobora comes from the written accounts of the Endeavor, which again is Captain Cook's ship that traveled to Tahiti to observe the transit of Venus, among other things. After they fulfilled that mission, and after summarily destroying relationships with locals in Tahiti because basically two of his crew deserted, so he decided to kidnap five of the local chiefs in order to convince local Tahitians to find his crew members and bring them back to him, but really in the end all it did was make everybody angry. Anyway, after observing the transit of Venus and realizing that he was probably not welcome on Tahiti anymore, Cook decided to chart the rest of the islands in French Polynesia and beyond, and also possibly find the fabled southern continent. Interestingly, the Endeavour actually landed at Opoa in 1769 because Tubaya, the priest from Ra'iatea who fled to Papara on Tahiti in the aftermath of the attack by Bora Bora, and who became a high priest of Papara and a leading priest of Oro on Tahiti, led Cook to Ra'iatea. Now, when the Endeavour was in Matavai Bay on the north coast of Tahiti, Tupaya had actually befriended Joseph Banks, the chief scientist on board the Endeavour. And Tupaya had also served as Cook's ceremonial advisor from time to time while they stayed on Tahiti, although unfortunately he wasn't really consulted in the whole chief hostage situation until much later. By the time Cook decided to leave Tahiti, Tupaya had relatively little left for him due to being on the losing side of recent battles and at times actually siding with the British over certain Tahitians, particularly in the chief hostage situation. So because of that, Tupaya decided to sail with Cook. And when Cook left Tahiti, he actually let Tupaya decide where to go next. Tupaya had significant navigational and astronomical training given his status as a high priest, and it made sense to let Tupaya show Cook where nearby important places were. So Tupaya decided to take the ship to Tapu Tapuatea. Now, he didn't immediately take them to Tapu Tapuatea. He first went to Huahine, which is a neighboring island that was also suffering from raids by Bora Bora. Tupaya hoped that showing Cook what was happening on Huahine would convince Cook to free Ra'iatea and Huahine at the same time. But Cook decided that he didn't want to get involved in local politics, so Tupaya then took him from Huahine to Ra'iatea in the hopes of changing his mind. Having anchored just offshore, Tupaya convinced Cook that the warriors from Bora Bora, who still lived on the island, would attack the ship the next day. Cook, wanting to avoid conflict, hurriedly went ashore and raised an English flag at Tapu Tapuatea. He then read a proclamation claiming Ra'iatea, Taha'a, Hawahine, and Bora Bora in the name of King George III of Great Britain. Now remember how the priest Vaita made a prophecy when warriors from Bora Bora were destroying Marai Tapu Tapuatea, and that prophecy said that people would arrive who looked different to locals in a canoe without an outrigger, and they would take possession of the the island on the site of Tapu Tapuatea? Well, 
so did Tobiah. By bringing Cook and his officers to the site and encouraging them to do their flag raising ceremony, Tobiah had orchestrated the fulfillment of Vita's prophecy. Tobiah hoped this would help free the island, but again, Cook refused to get involved in local politics, aside from, you know, claiming the island for colonial rule. Since the crew of the Endeavour did visit Maraitapu Tapuatea, however, we have written accounts of what the site looked like at the time. Now, there is an unbroken oral tradition on Raiatea, but that oral tradition is kept by locals and is not necessarily shared with outsiders. In 1769, when the officers of the Endeavour visited Taputapuatea, they noted that the marae still had its ahu or platform at the back, which stood about two and a half meters high and was lined with large slabs of coral that stood up to three meters tall. It also had many carved planks or unu at the top and a fata or sacrificial platform that was situated next to the ahu. There was also a large house nearby where the sacred drums were kept, and the main platform had four or five fare atua, or god houses that stood on posts. But the descriptions also note how few people seemed to populate the area and how dispirited they were compared to the Tahitians that Cook and his crew had met on Tahiti. As I said, there isn't much information about Tapu Tapuetea between 1769 and the fieldwork done by Emery in 1925. In fact, the next description of the site that I could find comes from Terangi Hiroa, a prominent Maori doctor, military leader, anthropologist, museum director, and politician who visited the site in 1929. I had made my pilgrimage to Tapu Tapuatea, but the dead could not speak to me. It was sad to the verge of tears. I felt a profound regret. A regret for... I knew not what. Was it for the beating of the temple drums or the shouting of the populace as the king was raised on high? Was it for the human sacrifices of olden times? It was for none of these individually, but for something at the back of them all some living spirit and divine courage that existed in ancient times, of which Taputapuetea was a mute symbol. It was something that we Polynesians have lost and cannot find, something that we yearn for and cannot recreate. The background in which that spirit was engendered has changed beyond recovery. The bleak wind of oblivion had swept over Opoa. Foreign weeds grew over the untended courtyard, and stones had fallen from the sacred altar of Taputapuetea. The gods had long ago departed. Based on that description, we can say that Maraita Putapuetea was largely abandoned by the early 1900s, and this is likely due to heavy French colonial efforts as well as extensive missionary work leading to the adoption of Christianity across French Polynesia. As for what happened with the site in the ensuing years, we have all the archaeological work from the 1920s to the late 2000s, which we talked about at the beginning of the video, but again, relatively little of that is publicly available or sufficiently detailed to say very much. Thankfully, however, Napapa Eva'u and the local community have been hard at work documenting sites and compiling details of the history of Tapu Tapuetea as well as other sites on the island. Because of the restoration works and the incredible campaigning by Napapa Eva'u, the site of Marai Tapu Tapuetea along with Marai Hauviri are both sites that are often used for ceremonies today. Visitors are also welcome so long as they are respectful of both the grounds and the local communities. But because of that, I would really recommend waiting until it's safe to travel in order to do so in a respectful manner, both to the sites themselves and to the local communities. And that's it for Tapu Tapu Atea. There is so much more to these islands and their history than I had time to get into here. So if you're interested, I highly recommend looking into the history of French Polynesia, particularly with an emphasis on the Polynesian perspective. If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe down below, and also feel free to hit that notification bell if you'd like to be among the first to know when I release a new video. Also, if you're interested in getting your hands on the schematic for this build or some additional information about the site, check out my Patreon via the link in the description down below. Speaking of which, thank you to all of my current patrons. Without your help, I would not be able to make these videos, so thank you very much for all of your support. That's all for me for today. Thank you all for tuning in, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye!